Okay, well, uh, thank you for coming. So uh, today's objectives are to hopefully discuss the epidemiology, risk factors, um, diagnosis, and prognostication of upper tract uh, urothelial carcinoma. I'll touch on uh, conservative management. Um, we'll talk about radical nephroureterectomy mm -hmm. and um, uh, some of the controversies surrounding management of the bladder cuff and lymphadenectomy. I'll uh, review the role of chemotherapy, um, both systemic mm -hmm. and intravesical, <coughs> in upper tract disease. Uh, briefly review surveillance strategy, and then throughout the talk, I'll also um, talk about the updated uh, EAU guidelines on uh, upper tract UC. So upper tract urothelial, car or urothelial carcinoma in general is the fourth uh, most common tumor. The majority occur in the bladder, only 5% in the upper tract, and the incidence is 1 to 2 per 100,000 cases per year. Uh, tends to present in the 70s, and there is a 3 to 1 uh, male preponderance. Now, because of the uh, rarity of the disease, it's been very difficult to um, perform randomized controlled trials, just mainly due to difficulty or cruel. So there's a lot of, um, there's three different, there's three large um, sort of multi-institutional uh, collaborations that have pooled data and have presented uh, several publications. The largest one is the upper tract um, urothelial carcinoma collaboration, mostly uh, centers in the U.S. and Europe, but also uh, one or two places in Canada. The French have a national uh, collaborative database, and there's also a Canadian upper track collaboration, and I'll present some papers from all three groups. So just some numbers. Um, uh, Pilocalus heel tumors are twice as more as common as tumors in the ureter. 20 to 30 percent of patients have had previous bladder cancer. Uh, bladder recurrence is very common, uh, 20 to 40 percent after radical nephroureterectomy. Uh, recurrence in the contralateral upper tract is um, uh, less uncommon, to, or uncommon, 2 to 6 percent. And the textbooks say that a patient that has bladder cancer has a 2 to 4 percent um, risk of developing upper tract uh, disease. And, the, at, and actually 50 percent present with uh, muscle invasive disease right off the bat. Uh, I think we're all familiar with most of the risk factors. I've uh, highlighted the um, uh, big ones here, uh, smoking and tobacco. I think we all know about aromatic hydrocarbons, uh, which have been used in sort of the textile and dye and petrochemical industry. Um, they've been banned since the 1960s. For these, you need about seven years of exposure, and there's a 20-year late latency period between the uh, termination of exposure and the development of disease. Uh, Phenacetin, again, which is no longer used as a risk factor. Uh, Balkan nephropathy, which is thought to be due to <coughs> exposure to aristocolic acid in um, uh, two different Chinese herbs. Uh, has been identified as a risk factor. The aristocolic acid causes a specific p53 mutation that's not seen in patients that haven't had exposure. And then interestingly, in the southwest coast of Taiwan, up to 25% of urothelial carcinomas are in the upper tract. And this is thought to be linked to blackfoot disease, which is a uh, gangrenous peripheral vascular disease um, thought to be from uh, arsenic exposure. Just a brief uh, comment on histology. So the majority present as pure urothelial carcinomas. 24% are histologic variants, the most common being squamous cell. And these are more likely to present with adverse pathologic features, but independently, um, they haven't been associated with um, uh, cancer-specific survival. The histologic grade of all urothelial carcinomas is based on the 2004 WHO classification, which classifies them into pan lump, low grade, and high grade. In the upper tract, uh, pond lump is virtually never diagnosed, uh, and about 29-30% present with low-grade disease, but the vast majority uh, present with high-grade disease. <coughs> the uh, TNM staging I've basically just included for uh, completion. Um, it's, the T staging is almost identical to bladder cancer with a little bit of difference whether the tumor is located in the renal pelvis or the ureter. The uh, nodal staging is similar to the previous bladder cancer nodal staging, which takes into account both the size and the uh, number of positive notes. So uh, moving on to diagnosis, um, after a history and physical exam, uh, urine cytology, uh, cystoscopy to rule out a bladder tumor, and CT urography, which is the most accurate imaging modality, are imperative. Uh, this is from the uh, EAU guidelines. Uh, in their guidelines, they say that diagnostic ureteroscopy and biopsy, they give it a level C classification, and there's some controversy surrounding this, whether it's needed in all patients uh, prior to nephroureterectomy, and I'll talk about that as well. Uh, but first, uh, a comment on cytology. Uh, voided bladder cytology is not as sensitive for the upper tract as it is for bladder. This particular group showed that um, the sensitivity and positive predictive value for positive voided bladder cytology is actually quite poor, um, between 50 and 60 percent, in terms of pre predicting high-grade disease or muscle invasive disease. Uh, 
if you include atypical cytology with it, then both um, sensitivity and positive predictive value improve. And the best numbers are seen when uh, you do uh, selective ureteral cytologies. But even in, in that case, the sensitivity is only 69% for high-grade disease. Uh, this have, has prompted some groups to look at FISH for um, diagnosis of upper tract tumors. The largest study was published last year. This particular group uh, looked at 285 patients with um, asymptomatic microhematuria and negative voided cytology. And they did fish analysis on the voided urine samples. And out of the 285, they had 11 positive fish tests, and nine of those patients had an upper tract tumor. And uh, there were no tumors detected in patients with a negative fish, so a negative predictive value of 100%. And that was confirmed um, also in another study, although with uh, less patients. So ureteroscopy and biopsy, again, the, e EA, uh, the EAU gives it a level C recommendation, but they do state that if available, uh, ureteroscopy and biopsy should be performed in the preoperative assessment of any patient. I think we can all agree that it's especially useful if there's any sort of diagnostic uncertainty, cases of a solitary <coughs> kidney, or if uh, conservative uh, management is being considered. So why is there controversy surrounding ureteroscopy? Well, it can be challenging to get good visualization of the upper tract and good biopsies. Up to 20% of upper tract biopsies are non-diagnostic in literature, and that's mostly due to the small amount of tissue that's obtained. It can be difficult to locate small lesions. Up to 45% of TA lesions can, are actually upstaged at the time of nephroureterectomy. And um, some have raised a concern that you're potentially delaying uh, definitive management. So I'll talk about some of the technology that's been developed to actually improve visualization of the upper tract during endoscopy. Um, photodynamic endoscopy is now used in bladder cancer. Basically um, uses um, uh, the accumulation of photoactive porphyrins in neoplastic tissue and um, the various substances can be given to induce that. The most common is 5-ALA. Uh, and in bladder, um, it's detected or it's improved the detection of papillary tumor by 20% improved detection of carcinoma in situ by almost 40 percent and it has been shown to uh, result in less residual tumor at re-resection if you actually use blue light endoscopy during TUR. The problem for using this in the upper tract is installation of the 5-ALA. In the bladder you can install intravesically but for the upper tract you do need a nephrostomy tube. There's one study that looked at oral um, 5-ALA in the upper tract. They gave it to three to four hours prior to ureteroscopy and then did blue light endoscopy. And they were, to, I, they were able to identify 28% new lesions that were not seen with um, conventional um, endoscopy. And with biopsy, 70% of those lesions were malignant. <coughs> the other technology that's being developed is narrow band imaging. This basically requires a special uh, ureteroscope. Olympus makes one. And there's an option on it where you can restrict the wavelength of light to a narrow um, uh, sort of limit. And in that limit, the uh, tissues that are really rich in blood vessels, so neoplastic tissue, absorb the light, and normal urethelium reflects it. So you get really high um, definition of the normal urethelium. You can see from the pictures here, the tumor is not very appreciable when you're using conventional imaging. But with a narrow band, you get nice and ha a nice definition of the normal urethelium, and you can clearly see the papillary tumor there. And uh, Traxer and colleagues uh, looked at this technique um, in a group of patients, and they were able to, they were able to improve the tumor detection rate by 22 percent. And in 14 percent of those cases, cases the lesions were only seen with uh, narrow band imaging. How about delaying uh, definitive therapy? Uh, this. Uh, Nissen and colleagues, this was a French group, they looked at um, oncologic outcomes in patients who either had ureteroscopy and biopsy before nephro-ureterectomy or whether they went, to, went straight to ureterectomy after suspicious imaging. The uh, difference in the interval was about 35 days and they found that there was no difference in oncologic outcomes. Um, another group several years ago showed that there is upstaging of the tumor if you wait longer than three months. But I think the data shows that if the uh, interval is reasonable, um, then the oncologic outcomes aren't any worse. But I think probably the most useful aspect of uh, ureteroscopy and biopsy prior to nephro U is prognostication. Um, the authors in this study from MD Anderson, several other centers, they developed a nomogram to predict organ confined disease, non organ confined disease, so pathologic T3 to 4 or pathologic nor positive disease based only on uh, ureteroscopic parameters. So the three parameters are tumor location, the tumor grade on ureteroscopic biopsy, 
and the tumor architecture, whether it's sessile or papillary. And with these three, um, they validated this in 700 patients, and the accuracy of this is about 77%. Um, so potentially, ureteroscopy and biopsy has a role in prognostication and identifying patients who might benefit from uh, neoadjuvant treatment, uh, which we'll talk about as well. While on the topic of prognostication, um, very, a lot of fact, different factors have been looked at. Patient factors that have shown to be um, impactful on prognosis are age, race, uh, performance status, obesity, and also smoking, uh, which I'll uh, comment on as well. Um, with respect to the disease factors, the location, clinical grade, uh, hydronephrosis, symptomatic presentation, and previous or synchronous bladder cancer um, has been associated with uh, poor outcomes. Just a quick comment on smoking. Uh, we know that it's a risk factor to de develop upper tract disease, but recent literature also shows that current smokers and heavy ex-smokers actually have a high risk for local recurrence, intravesical recurrence, and metastases. And uh, this particular study showed that if you quit smoking 10 years um, prior to nephroureterectomy, the risk of recurrence sort of returns to um, uh, the level of a non-smoker. Uh, intraoperative factors can also be uh, prognostic, and uh, I'll talk about this uh, during the treatment portion, uh, specifically with lymphadenectomy and management of the ureteric cuff. And then the pathologic prognostic factors, by far the most important are tumor stage and grade, but um, carcinoma in situ, nodal involvement, multifocality, and lymphovascular invasion uh, are the other major ones. Uh, two recent publications uh, have developed nomograms to predict um, either overall survival or cancer-specific survival based on some of these parameters. The first one here is from the French collaborative database. Um, they developed this in uh, over a thousand patients and uh, the components are tumor location, grade, age, stage, and nodal status. And that's used to predict three and five year overall survival. And then the upper track collaboration um, published their nomograms. They have two different ones, one for recurrence-free survival and one for cancer-free survival. The, concord the uh, concordance indices are 75 to 80 percent, and the components are, again, age, um, T-class, T-score, or T-stage, grade, uh, nodal invasion, lymphovascular invasion, architecture, whether it's sessile or papillary, and uh, carcinoma in situ. Uh, moving on to treatment, so we'll talk about nephroureterectomy, which is still the gold standard um, when included um, with bladder cuff um, excision. I'll talk about conservative therapy as well, so either endoscopic management or segmental ure uh, ureterectomy, and then finally we'll talk about chemotherapy. So for conservative uh, treatment, the indications can be imperative, uh, relative, or elective. The imperative indications are in a patient with a solitary kidney, uh, renal insufficiency or bilateral disease. Uh, poor operative candidates have a relative indication for this. And then the elective indications based on the current guidelines are reserved if there's a low-grade, um, small, solitary, non-invasive tumor in a highly compliant patient. Uh, this particular group from the UK looked at their 20-year experience in conservative management of non-muscle invasive upper tract disease. So they looked at 129 patients with clinical uh, T1 or less, who either who underwent either ureteroscopic ablation or percutaneous resection, and they uh, compared that to a cohort of patients who had radical nephro-U. Their outcomes were local recurrence uh, in the ipsilateral upper tract or the nephrectomy bed, and they also looked at uh, intravesical recurrence. The take-home message from that is that the, there was a very high rate of recurrence. 71% of patients managed conservatively uh, recurred in the ipsilateral upper tract. And the numbers were uh, far worse with high-grade disease. You can see that the five-year um, recurrence-free survival is extremely poor uh, if you have high-grade disease. The same group showed that uh, nephroureterectomy was beneficial in terms of uh, uh, progression-free survival and also overall survival. Um, it's interesting that for, for disease-specific survival, the, they didn't find a difference even in high-grade disease. And that's because all the patients that had high-grade disease eventually went on to have radical nephro U because of disease progression. And despite having the salvage radical nephro U, the overall survival in the group of patients that had delayed treatment was actually worse. So patients who had nephro up upfront for high-grade disease did better than if they had conservative management first than um, sort of salvage radical nephro U. Overall, 21% of the patients progressed, uh, four developed metastases, but all those patients had high-grade disease. 
and there was also more intravesical recurrence in the group of patients that were managed endoscopically. Uh, Michael Grasso's group in New York uh, also looked at their uh, experience managing tumors endoscopically. Uh, and again, in their data, the same 77% <coughs> recurrence is seen. There was 15% grade progression, and 16% uh, of patients ended up having delayed uh, nephroureterectomy. And you can see from the uh, figure here, the outcomes in the first two years are very good, but there is a significant drop-off um, uh, two years out following endoscopic treatment, even for low-grade disease. So the take-home points should be that it really uh, endoscopic management should only be reserved for patients with low-grade tumors. Uh, recurrence, even in low-grade disease, is very common, up to 70%. There's about a 15 to 20% risk of progression. And the um, uh, oncologic outcomes beyond really two years uh, haven't been shown to be very robust. So um, really caution should be exercised in young patients. Uh, segmental ureterectomy is the other uh, conservative uh, modality. The EAU guidelines say that for proximal and mid-ureteric tumors, uh, radical nephru is still gold standard, but you can consider segmental resection um, in an elective situation, again, with low-grade, um, non-muscle invasive tumor, or in an imperative indication for high-grade tumors. But they still say that for the distal ureter, um, uh, segmental resection is acceptable even in high-risk disease. Uh, two recent publications have been published on this. This is again from the uh, French group. They looked at segmental resection in 42 patients and compared it to radical nephro-U in about 400 patients. And um, their indications for segmental resection were either imperative or again elective in a non-invasive uh, low-grade tumor. And they found that there was no difference in any of the oncologic outcomes they looked at. But this was actually quite a poor study because their endpoints were kind of strange. They looked at bladder recurrence and recurrence in the contralateral upper tract. And they didn't uh, consider recurrence in the ipsilateral upper tract, which I think is what probably should have been included. Um, also, the <coughs> groups were not equivalent. The patients who had nephro-U had um, uh, more high-grade disease, more advanced T-stage of presentation, and also much more lymphovascular invasion. Another study published uh, looked at the SEER database, and they identified 200 patients um, that had segmental resection. And again, they concluded that there was no difference in outcomes. <clears throat> but again, they did not specify the location of the tumors, and they didn't specify the indications for segmental resection, and we don't really know uh, what the stage and the grade of the patients who had segmental resection was. So again, it's quite weak data. So I think to summarize, uh, segmental ureterectomy should again be reserved for low-grade, non-invasive tumors in the distal ureter only, and the data suggesting equivalent long-term oncologic outcomes in high-grade disease or invasive distal tumors is really not all that robust. <clears throat> and just to wrap up uh, conservative management, I want to talk about adjuvant therapy with uh, BCG or mitomycin. Uh, most of the studies have shown that for papillary upper tract disease, uh, there's no benefit with adjuvant BCG or mitomycin. Um, and there have been um, a high rate of complications such as ureteric stricture and also death has been reported from systemic absorption of mitomycin seen to the upper tract. The largest study for papillary disease uh, was from Rasti Nahad and colleagues. They um, did six uh, weekly BCG um, anti-grade installations after percutaneous resection and they matched and they compared those patients to a, a matched cohort and they found that there was no difference in recurrence, uh, time to recurrence or progression. Uh, there is some evidence for um, BCG installation for carcinoma in situ. The uh, largest study uh, on this is from Earth Studer's group. They published a couple of years ago, and they looked at 55 patients who either had anti-grade BCG installation for curative intent in carcinoma in situ, or if they had um, uh, non-muscle invasive disease and had BCG as an adjuvant modality after endoscopic treatment. They, did, they used three vials of BCG and 150 cc's of saline and infused through a nephrostomy tube uh, once per week at one cc per minute. And they didn't use a ureteric catheter, but they did do anti-grade studies to make sure there was no distal obstruction. Again, they didn't have a control group, but um, their conclusions were that the um, outcomes seemed to be better in patients with carcinoma in situ, so less recurrence and less progression in the carcinoma in situ group compared to the TA and T1 group, but again, there was no control group to compare to. <clears throat> so to summarize, uh, conservative treatment should really be reserved for low-grade, uh, non-invasive tumors and absence of any other uh, poor prognostic features, and um, uh, uh, 
patients selected for this should be highly compliant, and that's really basically what the uh, EAU guidelines say. <coughs> so moving on to uh, nephroureterectomy. Um, yeah, they do. It's uh, I, I get to that later, right at the end. Yeah. <coughs> so for um, radical nephroureterectomy, still considered um, gold standard. And uh, in this section, I'd like to talk about um, whether there's a benefit to open or minimally invasive approaches, um, whether there's any difference in the management of the bladder cuff, and uh, what the role of lymphadenectomy is in uh, radical nephro So several uh, studies recently have tried to look at the outcomes of open uh, or laparoscopic nephro There's only one randomized trial out of Italy on this, and they randomized 80 patients to um, either laparoscopic or an open procedure uh, with a 41-month follow-up and they found no difference in five-year uh, cancer-specific or metastasis-free survival. In their subgroup analysis, patients who had T3 disease actually had better outcomes if they had an open procedure, and you can see the Kaplan-Meier curves here, but there were only 16 patients in that category, so the study wasn't really powered to show that. The largest series comparing open to laparoscopic is from Capitano and colleagues. They looked at over 1,200 patients, and again, found no difference in uh, five-year oncologic outcomes. And I've included this here just to show that most of the series looking at open and lap, um, in the laparoscopic group, the patients usually have a far less aggressive disease on presentation. The <coughs> uh, Canadian um, Upper Track Collaboration also published their data this year. They looked at 850 patients, and again, there was no difference in uh, oncologic outcomes um, between open and uh, MIS groups. There was also a Cochrane database just recently published on this, and again, no difference between uh, long-term oncologic outcomes. They did, however, say that for uh, laparoscopic procedure, there was less uh, intravesical recurrence, but again, that should be um, sort of looked at with caution because uh, patients were lower risk to begin with, and then the management of the bladder cuff could be a confounding factor. <coughs> So to summarize this portion, uh, open and MIS pr uh, approaches have equivalent oncologic efficacy for organ-confined disease as long as the sort of oncologic surgical principles would adhere to. And I say organ-confined here because most of the studies um, that have looked at this, the patients are, have organ-confined disease that underwent laparoscopic procedures. The EAU guidelines still say that invasive or large tumors are a contraindication to uh, laparoscopic procedure until proven otherwise. So then uh, next is bl bladder cuff management, whether that makes a difference or not. So uh, the different approaches are an extravesical approach, which can either be open or lap, uh, transvesical, which can be open or through a variety of procedures uh, described, and then an endoscopic approach, um, which uh, there have been two main um, approaches published on that. Uh, the transvesical open technique is sort of self-explanatory. I'm not going to go over this. Um, really, the only point is that it's uh, contraindicated if there's a concomitant bladder tumor. Uh, the uh, pure lap transvesical approach was described by Hattori and colleagues. Um, uh, basically, the ureters retracted okay, Kefla. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. So the uh, transvesical pure lap approach, um, uh, very similar. The, you place a stay stitch in the bladder, um, incise the UO, and then excise the intramural ureter and close the defect. Uh, Gill and colleagues <coughs> describe the laparoscopic ligation and detachment techniques. Um, and that, in the beginning of the procedure, you place sort of two ports into the bladder. Uh, a ureteric catheter is placed uh, through one of the ports. The intramural ureter is retracted. Through the other port, an endo loop is placed around the you to prevent tumor spillage, and then the intramural ureter is resected endoscopically, and then after completion of uh, the uh, nephrectomy and ureterectomy, the specimen is delivered uh, extravesically. The extravesical technique, uh, which I guess is Dr. Glee's favorite, uh, either open or 
um, uh, MIS. Um, the main thing is you must ensure that the, the intramural ureter is removed. Um, and um, you can come across the bladder cuff either with a stapler or right angle clamp. And the only really qu question I have is whether the actual staple line affects the uh, uh, distal ureteric margin, and maybe Dr. Jones can comment on this um, at some point. <coughs> Sorry. This? Pardon me? Yeah, no, I mean, the, some of the laparoscopic uh, uh, papers that were described, they say they come across it with a stapler. But um, I, I agree, you, you don't need it. You can just come, out, come across it with a clamp. Pardon me? Yeah. And then finally, the uh, endoscopic technique. So there's two main ones uh, described. The first one, the pluck technique or the um, uh, TUR technique, uh, is basically resecting the intramural ureter down to perivesical fat. And then the other technique, um, the intussusception or the ureteric stripping, um, involves placing a ureteric catheter, transecting the ureter, securing the ureter to the catheter, delivering it into the bladder, intussuscepting it, and then removing it uh, transurethrally. So do these techniques make a, make a difference in terms of um, oncologic outcomes? There was a recent publication on this, and uh, they looked at over uh, 2,500 patients who had radical nephro-U, and they compared the open transvesical method, the extravesical method, either lap or open, and then endoscopic TUR. And their outcomes were disease recurrence, either locally or in uh, regional nodes or metastases, and also bladder recurrence. So overall, uh, there was a 28% uh, uh, disease recurrence in the cohort, and there was a 22% intravesical recurrence. They showed that, the man that uh, in terms of management of the bladder cuff, there were no difference sort of in oncologic outcomes in terms of local or systemic recurrence, but the patients <coughs> that had uh, an endoscopic approach, so either TUR or ureteric stripping, had uh, more intravesical recurrence compared to the other approaches. And then the extravesical and the intravesical approaches were equivalent based on this study. So uh, to summarize that, uh, many techniques have been described and are acceptable. Um, I think the endoscopic management of the bladder cuff, however, at least based on the data that's out there, has been shown to be inferior with respect to uh, intravesical recurrence. The uh, next section is uh, lymphadenectomy um, for upper tract disease. I think the benefits of lymph node dissection um, in bladder cancer is well published and documented, but there are certain uh, considerations in upper tract disease. First, the anatomic limits um, have not been very well defined. 40% uh, of patients with pathologic node positive disease have negative imaging. And in the literature, there's, the, there's very high variability in terms of node dissection. In the laparoscopic series, um, there's about a 75 to 80% uh, pathologic NX. Um, and even in some of the open series, um, no nodes have been identified in up to 50 or 60 percent of cases. Uh, Dr. Finelli's group recently looked at the Ontario Cancer Registry, and they found that um, uh, nodes were identified in only 27 percent of uh, radical nephro-U specimens. And in most of those cases, uh, the nodes were identified in the nephrectomy specimen, and a separate um, nodal packet was not sent. So the uh, EAU guidelines state that lymphadenectomy is recommended in case of invasive upper tract disease, and that's really all they say, and there isn't much elaboration on that. So uh, what does the data show? Um, the French group um, published this um, this year. They looked at 700 patients who um, uh, either had lymphadenectomy or uh, no lymphadenectomy, and they found that on their multivariable analysis, lymph node status did not predict uh, any oncologic outcomes. But the problem with this study was that 64% of patients were pathologic NX, so no nodes were identified, and the median number of nodes removed was only two, which um, I think is a major drawback to make that conclusion. So then, how many nodes are actually required um, to get one positive node? Um, this particular study looked at that. They reviewed uh, 650 patients who, who had radical nephro-U at centers where lymphadenectomy was routinely being done. They excluded patients with carcinoma in situ and T1 just because of the low risk of nodal involvement. This was a high risk group. Up to 25% of patients had pathologic node positive disease. And the mean number of nodes removed in this study was uh, 6.7, so much higher than the two uh, from the French study. 
they showed that if you removed eight nodes, there was a 75% chance of finding one positive node. And if you removed 13 nodes, there was a 95% chance of removing a positive node. And on their multivariable analysis, um, they found that if you had eight or more nodes removed, um, that predicted uh, pathologic node positivity. So really, if um, even if there's no therapeutic advantage to add it, based on this data, to adequately stage patients, you need at least eight nodes on the specimen to really say whether they're pathologic N0 or not. The same group looked at the impact of node dissection on cancer-specific survival. Uh, they showed that for patients who had uh, pathologic T2 to T4 disease, node status was, node status was a significant predictor of uh, oncologic outcomes. The most interesting findings were that if you were pathologic N0, the number of nodes removed were associated with higher cancer-specific survival, but if you were pathologic and positive, the number of nodes removed was not associated with um, any survival outcomes. And uh, to me, that really says that to the number of nodes removed, even if there's no therapeutic benefit, really makes that definition of pathologic N0 very accurate. So you know the patients are adequately staged, um, and that has prognostic implications in terms of uh, adjuvant therapy. So, so they um, so th these were some of the crew templates they looked at. Um, I, th I think most of the cases they just said pericable or periodic. They didn't go in that particular study. They didn't go retrocable or interaortic cable. Um, this this paper here, the Condos group looked at um, uh, to see if there's actually a proper template for node dissection for upper tract disease. So they looked at 200 patients and correlated the location of the tumor to the um, pattern of lymph node metastases, and it sort of follows that right to left uh, drainage in the retroperitoneum. For disease in the right renal pelvis, the, uh, no, the landing sites were in the hilum, the, um, pre the uh, paracaval area, but also the retrocaval area, on the left side only to the paraaortic and the um, hilum. In the upper two-thirds of the ureter, again, that right to left drainage, so on the right side, the, um, not only the hilum and the pericaval area, but also <coughs> retrocaval and interaortic cable, and on the uh, left side only periaortic. And then for the pelvic ureter, the uh, drainage was similar to bladder or uh, prostate. So then the same group looked at whether doing a template node dissection had any uh, impact on survival. They compared 41 patients who had <coughs> node dissection just at the discretion of the surgeon, um, and 78 patients who had a template node dissection based on the template that they proposed, and they found that the number of nodes removed was not associated with um, oncologic outcomes, but the patients who had the template node dissection actually had better uh, cancer-specific survival on their multivariate analysis compared to patients who did not have a template node dissection. So, uh, They're small numbers. Yeah, no, I mean this is this is all it's all highly controversial. I don't think you can conclude that on that study, but it's just yeah. I agree with you. It's just No, they did on, on multivariate, yeah. So to uh, summarize the lymphadenectomy summary, again, it's, it's very controversial. The uh, small numbers, um, it's uh, tough to make any definitive conclusions, but uh, you know, based on the data that's available, it probably should be performed in patients with pathologic um, sort of muscle invasive disease or anything with more advanced disease. And how to identify these patients for some of the preoperative nomograms that we talked about can be used to do that. Um, I think at the least it probably in, provides more accurate staging um, and you know, possibly a therapeutic benefit, but based on the current studies you can't conclude that. So just to summarize the surgical treatment, um, again, radical net for use is the gold standard for any sort of invasive, high grade, or um, advanced disease. Um, open and MIS approaches are probably equivalent. Um, bladder cuff removal is imperative, and um, the EAU guidelines say that the ureteric stripping method is inferior, but I think the new data shows that any sort of endoscopic management of the bladder cuff uh, is inferior. <laughs>
And then uh, finally, we'll talk about chemotherapy, and uh, that'll be it. So uh, first, I'll talk about adjuvant intravesical chemotherapy. So we've talked about how there's a very high rate of bladder recurrence uh, following radical nephro for you in uh, 20 to 40 percent of patients, and 70 percent uh, recur in the first year. Uh, the mechanism can be either tumor shedding from the upper tract, and some, people, some groups have said whether the angiogenic factors are released and respond to the bladder wound during the bladder cuff management, and whether the perioperative immune, compromise, uh, immune compromisation uh, plays a role. We know that uh, mitomycin C following TRBT for papillary bladder tumour reduces recurrence by 15 to 30 percent. So is there a um, uh, role for the upper tract? There was a randomised trial recently published on this, as the, the OTMIT-C trial. They um, randomised 20, 284 patients uh, to either adjuvant intravesical chemotherapy post-op or no intravesical chemotherapy. They, they uh, installed 40 milligrams of mitomycin on postoperative day 7 before the catheter was removed, and they did not do any um, uh, cystograms prior to uh, installation. They powered the study to detect a 50% relative re risk reduction with a 90% confidence. And their primary endpoint was uh, bladder cancer, bladder recurrence in the first 12 months uh, following therapy. For follow-up, they did cystoscopy at three months, six months, and one year, and they did not require a histologic proof of recurrence. Basically, visual identification of a papillary tumor was enough in this study. So based on that, their one-year uh, bladder recurrence for patients who had mitomycin was 16%, and 27% in uh, patients who did not have mitomycin. The absolute risk reduction was 11%, 40% relative risk reduction, and the uh, number needed to treat was 9. Uh, they did subgroup analysis to see if there was a particular subgroup that benefited more, and um, uh, they didn't make that conclusion. But, it's, but in the low-grade patients, there was only one recurrence uh, out of 18 uh, intravesically. So how do we identify patients that are high risk for intravesical recurrence? Um, again, there's recently a nomogram published on this from the Upper Tri Collaboration. Um, they looked at 1,800 patients, and uh, using the North American cohort, they developed the nomogram, and then used the European cohort to validate it. And so this is a nomogram. They, put, uh, the, they have uh, age, gender, previous bladder cancer, uh, location of the primary tumor, uh, stage, car carcinoma in situ, and lymph node, um, invasion were our components in the nomogram. And it's interesting, they also included the uh, management of the uh, distal ureteric cuff, which showed up on their multivariable analysis, and then also um, a laparoscopic technique was in this nomogram associated with wars, with higher uh, bladder recurrence. But they have a second version of the nomogram which they left out the uh, ureteric cuff and the laparoscopic approach and only have the uh, pathologic factors. So to summarize, the intravesical chemo, um, there is a 40% relative risk reduction in intravesical recurrence after uh, radical nephrourethrectomy. Um, does earlier administration of the mitomycin make a difference? I mean, they, they instilled it a week post-op mainly to uh, prevent um, extravasation and obviously the complications. So is there a role for a preoperative sort of electromotive administration in terms of decreasing bladder risk? Um, and I don't think there's an answer to that yet. So moving on to uh, neoadjuvant chemo, um, the benefits have been uh, well documented in bladder cancer. I think the advantages for uh, upper tract disease is uh, potential early treatment of micrometastatic disease, downstaging the primary tumor, and probably the most important for upper tract disease is better renal function uh, prior to losing one of the kidneys. Uh, the disadvantages are you're potentially over-treating some patients. You need accurate preoperative risk stratification to identify patients who might benefit from it and potentially uh, increased risk of surgical complications. Um, there have been two um, sort of neoadjuvant studies um, for upper tract disease. Uh, the first one's from uh, MD Anderson. They looked at 48 patients who had neoadjuvant chemotherapy um, af before radical nephrourethrectomy, and their indications were high-grade disease on biopsy, um, sessile lesion, or uh, large, tumor large tumor burden sort of judged uh, uh, subjectively by the surgeon. And they compared that to a cohort of patients with no adjuvant or no new adjuvant therapy, and their outcomes were mainly downstaging and complete remission. And they didn't they didn't look at uh, survival. The chart here shows that the patients who had chemotherapy and they're sort of the shaded areas have a left shift uh, towards um, lower um, uh, T stage after nephrourethrectomy. So they concluded that there was at least downstaging with new adjuvant chemo. And there was a 25 percent reduction in the incidence of pathologic T2. 41% reduction in pathologic T3, 
and there was a 14% uh, complete remission. Um, the Upper Track Collaboration also published data on neoadjuvant therapy. They compared 18 patients who had neoadjuvant chemo um, to patients with um, uh, either no adjuvant chemo or patients who received adjuvant chemotherapy. Um, again, they did show a significant number of patients downstaged, um, and they did conclude that the group one, which is the new adjuvant group, had better disease-free survival, but again, only 18 patients had new adjuvant chemotherapy, so you can't really uh, make any conclusions based on that. Uh, moving on to adjuvant therapy, um, again, the advantages are you base treatment on pathology and you're not over-treating patients and there's no delay in surgery. But the major disadvantage for upper tract disease is the renal function decline after having one of the kidneys removed. There have been several published studies on adjuvant therapy, um, the largest ones from the upper tract collaboration. They looked at 540 patients with uh, pathologic T3 or 4 and no positive disease. 22% had adjuvant chemotherapy and most of them received the MVAC and 20% had GEMSYS and their outcomes were overall survival and cancer specific survival. And they found that there was no difference um, in outcomes in patients who had adjuvant chemo and even in their subgroup analyses uh, separating T3 disease, T4 and no positive disease, the uh, outcomes were similar. The uh, French group uh, also published a, a study on adjuvant chemo Again, this was retrospective, but they included patients who had metastatic disease, which, again, in this setting, I don't think uh, makes much sense. Um, and uh, the chemo uh, regimens were also highly variable and not very standardized. And based on this data, there was also no difference in um, uh, cancer-specific survival. Uh, another group from uh, Korea, again, looked at adjuvant chemotherapy. They showed that intravesical recurrence was lower in patients who had adjuvant chemo but the overall cancer-specific survival uh, was not any different. And then finally, this study showed um, uh, you know, why adjuvant chemo is problematic for upper tract disease. They looked at 177 patients, and only 30% of them had adjuvant chemotherapy. And in the majority of cases, it was because the renal function um, wasn't adequate enough to receive chemotherapy. So postoperatively, only 24% of patients had a GFR greater than 60 and 44% uh, um, had a GFR greater than 45. So to summarize the systemic chemo, uh, I don't think the data is uh, robust enough to make strong recommendations, but strong consideration should be given to neoadjuvant therapy in locally invasive or no positive disease. It's also interesting that there's really no data at all on adjuvant chemo in high-risk T2, so patients with either lymphovascular invasion, concomitant carcinoma in situ, or sessile lesions. On the nomograms that we talked about, they, they only have a 40% cancer-specific survival at five years based on the nomogram. And really, no studies have looked at whether adjuvant chemo uh, in this setting is beneficial or not. And the EAU basically says that there's insufficient data to uh, provide any recommendation. Okay, and for the last few slides, so this is the uh, surveillance guidelines from the um, uh, EAU. So for conservative management here, Dr. Chu, they recommend um, cytology and CT CT urography at three months, six months, and annually. Um, cystoscopy, ureteroscopy, and cytology at three months, six months, then every six months for two years, and then yearly. So very intensive monitoring for conservative disease, or for uh, endoscopic management. Uh, CT urography is one or the other. For, for, for follow following radical nephro-U, they basically divided into either whether the tumor was non-invasive or whether it was invasive, which I think is a little bit crude given all the um, sort of pathologic prognostic factors that have been recently published. So for non-invasive tumors, they recommended cytology at three months and yearly, and then a CT every year. And for invasive disease, they recommend cysto and cytology at three months and annually, and then CT for six months for the first two years and then annually after that. The uh, CUA uh, recently published guidelines on uh, surveillance of the upper tract and their sort of risk categories are a little bit more well defined. So in the low risk group they have low grade lesions, um, non-muscle invasive, um, high grade lesions or T2 and intermediate risk and then their high risk are patients who present with no positive disease or greater than T2. But again, the majority of their um, recommendations are quite similar except the frequency of the uh, CT and the chest X-ray. 
And then finally, this is some of the uh, data that uh, we've worked here. It's a multivariable analysis from the Canadian uh, database. Um, and based on the multivariable analysis from, the, from those patients, we identified three risk categories. Um, so patients in the low risk group have TA to T1 tumors with no adverse pathologic features. The intermediate risk group have non-invasive tumors with any one of these adverse pathologic features. And then patients with no positive disease or muscle invasive disease are in the high risk group. And then we looked at the uh, recurrence pattern um, based on anatomic site in each of these cat risk categories and based on that came up with a, a surveillance protocol and uh, hopefully we'll publish this soon. So to conclude, um, ureteroscopy and biopsy aids in prognostication and probably should be performed uh, prior to radical nephroureterectomy. Uh, conservative management should be reserved for low-grade tumors only. There is a high risk of recurrence even in low-grade disease. And conservative management outcomes beyond two years um, are likely inferior to radical nephroureterectomy. Um, there's likely minimal benefit from adjuvant BCG or mitomycin in the upper tract for papillary disease, um, except in the setting of carcinoma in situ. The endoscopic management of the bladder cuff is associated with higher intravesical recurrence. Um, lymphadenectomy during nephroureterectomy provides, um, I think, valuable prognostic information and potentially therapeutic. Um, adjuvant intravesical mitomycin after radical nephroureterectomy should be considered and uh, strong consideration should also be given to neoadjuvant uh, systemic chemo um, in patients that have clinical T3 to 4 disease or uh, who have uh, clinical no positive disease. And uh, that's all I have. Thank you very much. And uh, happy holidays. Thank you.